بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أحمده وأستعينه وأؤمن به وأتوكل عليه وكفى بالله وكيلا ثم أصلي وأسلم على خاتم أنبيائه وأفضل سفرائه المحمود الأحمد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين المهدي المنتظر فداه أرواح العالمين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم ولو أن أهل القرى آمنوا واتقوا لفتحنا عليهم بركات من السماء والأرض ولكن كذبوا فأخذناهم بما كانوا يكسبون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Tonight, I would like to discuss the significance of the event and visitation of Al Arba'in in paving the way and creating a Mahdawi culture. An integral part of our creed and our belief is that each believer, each mu'min and mu'mina, has the responsibility to prepare himself or himself, uh, herself or himself for the support of our Imam. Now, this is based on multiple ahadith, and we all understand this. Now, obviously, this requires a lot of work on multiple fronts. For example, one of the fronts that need a lot of work for most, if not all of us, is the fact that we need to lessen our ties to this materialistic world. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not implying in any way, shape, or form that a mu'min um, isn't supposed to be living a comfortable life. In fact, it's the other way around. The ahadith tell us that it's mustahab for a mu'min to strive f uh, to provide for their family. Um, it is mustahab for you to work hard to maintain a comfortable life for your family. However, you need to understand that even though it's good and it's fine for you to have a nice house or a nice car, of course, given that you are um, uh, also, um, you know, you're, you're working on your... Um, in, in the religious front, you're working to um, do what you must um, with regards to your religious dues. However, you need to understand that you can't be attached to this house. You can't be attached to this car. And if you must, and at the time that you hear the call of Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam, then you have to let go of everything and go to support your imam. Now, I may, make, I may make it sound simple, but in reality, it's incredibly hard. Think of this example. Um, you work hard throughout your, you know, your later uh, high school years to get a good mark. Once you get a good mark, you are then qualified to get into a good school or university. Then you work hard throughout university to uh, get the required qualifications and the required degree to become a lawyer or a doctor. And through these um, countless uh, sleepless nights and um, days that you can't go to family events, events with your uh, friends because you're studying, Maybe 10, 15 years later, you are now happy, you're comfortable, you have your own practice. Suddenly, you are required to support your imam. Can you and do you have the ability to put everything down, let go of everything that you've worked so hard for to support your imam? And so here's where you think to yourself, it's, it's actually harder than one can actually fathom. So, 
This is one area that needs a lot of work, which is why, and even though this doesn't, you know, isn't um, directly related to the topic of tonight, I thought I'd, I'd uh, talk to you a little bit about this. Um, some of our scholars, they, I, I went to visit a scholar and he said that I don't have a single property under my name. Because as soon as you have something to your name, as soon as you have a car, a house, a building, an apartment under your name, it means that you're going to get, to get attached to that property. Now, this process of, of detachment from this materialistic world doesn't come easily, obviously. It needs a lot of effort. It needs austerity. So that's an area that we have to be working on. Another important front that, again, requires a lot of work for most of us is with regards to our manners, our akhlaq, and the way that we deal with um, our parents, our spouses, our children, our family members, even um, distant family members. Um, in general, your, your family, your neighbors, your brothers and sisters in faith, and even people who um, don't, even, don't even share the same uh, religion with you, just average people in, in the society. And this requires a lot of work. Um, again, uh, some of you think, you know, I, I'm probably um, doing, you know, what I'm responsible for. But once, once you look at the verses and you look at the traditions you try you'll then get a a better picture of of what i'm talking about now of course with regards to the groups that i named there are um specific uh rulings and specific akhlaq that apply to some of these groups rather than others for example, with regards to your parents, you're supposed to treat your parents um, differently. Um, but then there are those akhlaq that are general in nature. And for the lack of a better phrase, these are non-denominational. Whether the person that you're dealing with is a Muslim or a non-Muslim, Shia, non-Shia, even atheist, it doesn't matter because these rulings apply to this person, this individual. And to... Um, to, to, to prove my point, listen to this hadith. Imam al-Baqir says, You've all heard this. There's an exception to every rule. And it's as if the Imam is, is accepting this, this, uh, uh, this phrase. Because with regards to all of the Islamic rulings, there's always an exception. For example, Hajj is, is um, an important obligation for all Muslims. But if you don't have the funds required, then you don't need to go to Hajj. If you, um, if you don't feel safe going to Hajj, then the obligation of Hajj doesn't apply to you. Psalm, fasting, which is an even simpler one. If you're uh, sick, if you're unwell, uh, psalm or fasting, even though it's an obligation, in your case, which again is, is the person who is sick, it turns and it changes from being an obligation to, to, to being a prohibition. It becomes haram for you to fast. And so we understand that there's an exception to every rule. But in this hadith, Imam al-Baqir says, that there are three ruling or three things that no no except, uh, no uh, exceptions. There are no exemptions. There's no way around this. You need to fulfill these three things. What are these things? Number one, adaul amana il al barri wal fajr. If somebody entrusts you with something, do not break that trust. Give them their property back. 
It doesn't even need to be property. If someone entrusts you with a secret, then you have to um, be sure that you don't share that person's secret with others. Even if that person is an atheist, even if that person is your enemy, you are not supposed to break that trust. To the point that Imam Zain al-Abidin says, if the killer of my father, imagine that, the biggest terrorist in history, if the killer of my father entrusts me with the sword that he used to kill my father, then I would not break his trust and I would give him his sword back. And again, this isn't exclusive to belongings and properties. It also applies when someone entrusts you with a secret. They tell you something that others don't know about. So that's number one. No exceptions. Good person, bad person, whatever. Somebody trusts you with something, do not break that trust. Number two. If you promise, if you give a promise to anybody, whether it's your children, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, the police, the tax office, if you make a promise to somebody, make sure that you um, fulfill that promise. And in fact, with regards to our children that I mentioned, there's an interesting hadith, if I'm not mistaken, by Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says that if you make a promise to your children, for example, you're walking, you're taking a stroll outside, he sees um, that the neighbor has a beautiful bicycle. He says, ba uh, Baba, Dad, can you buy me a bike? And you say, Inshallah. Now, Arabs, Middle Easterners in general, are infamous for their inshallah. Basically, when they're saying inshallah, it means it'll never happen. And so you say inshallah, the child, his, his um, perception of inshallah is, yes, I'll, I'll buy you a bicycle. If you make that promise to your child, make sure that you fulfill it. Um, because the Imam says, the child obviously doesn't understand the connection between the creator and his creation, he doesn't understand that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is sustaining him or her um, and is providing for him or her. The child thinks that his, that his father, his parents are sustaining him. They are the ones that are providing for him. Therefore, when you break your promise to your child, then you are ruining the reputation of God. You are ruining the reputation of the person who is, of, of the being, excuse me, who is actually providing for this child and actually um, sustaining this child. And so make sure the Imam says that when you make a promise to somebody, you fulfill that promise. There is a prophet by the name of Ismail Sadiq al Wa'd. Now, he is mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقْ الْوَعْدِ this, is, this Ismail is different to Ismail, the son of Abraham. Um, the hadith says that he was known as Ismail Sadiq al waad the one that fulfills his promises. And the reason why he uh, became to be known by this, by this um, title is because he once made a promise to somebody. You know, I'll meet you at so-and-so cafe. The Prophet goes there, Prophet Ismail, he goes to that place at the required time, and it turns out that the person has stood him up. And so this prophet waits for that person for an entire year, because God forbid that he, uh, he make a promise to somebody, he makes a promise to somebody and doesn't fulfill that promise. And so this is really important, brothers and sisters. Muslims were known for people, uh, to be people who, who um, fulfilled their promises and commitments to other people. Make sure that we get this back. You make a promise to somebody, even if that somebody is, is an atheist, make sure that you uh, fulfill your promise and your commitment. And number three, Imam al-Baqir says the third point, the third thing um, that knows no exceptions is being kind to your parents. 
Barrayni kana aw fajrayn. Whether your parents are good people or bad people, God forbid, if your father is a drug addict, if your mother is an alcoholic, God forbid, your responsibility towards your parents is to be kind to them, no matter what. No matter how they treat you, if they take your belongings, if they um, treat you in a bad manner, your responsibility is to treat them with kindness, no matter what. Now, all of these subcategories, akhlaq, um, disconnection from this materialistic world, all of these things fall under one single category. And I'd like to call this um, category the Mahdawi culture. And this is the culture that will pave the way for its adherence to support the awaited Imam. And this will make us become law-abiding citizens among his nation. Now, one might think to himself, why do I need to maintain a Mahdawi culture when the Imam hasn't reappeared? And he might, he might not even appear during my lifetime. So why do I have to care about this? Well, for two reasons. Number one, it's not only for you. You are supposed to pass this culture on to the following generations until you get to the generation that will actually get the opportunity and the tawfiq to see the imam and support him. And number two, according to a lot of our hadith, if you know your imam, and if you are getting ready to support your imam, it doesn't matter if the imam reappears during your lifetime or not. In fact, the ahadith tell us that if you know the imam and you are doing what you have to do towards the imam and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you are to die, you will be given the reward of someone who is fighting under the banner of Imam, of imam al-Zaman And so it's not, um, it's not a matter of, of actually being in the presence of the Imam salam. It's a lifestyle that we have to maintain. Now, what is the relevance of this Mahdawi culture with regards to the Arba'in? Well, here's where I draw the connection. The visitation of Al Arba'in, in its core, it is based on the Mahdawi culture. And this is why, and if you've been to Iraq, if you've been to the Arba'in, you know what I'm talking about. The Iraqi people have endured a lot, more than many other nations. And throughout the years of Saddam, the tyrannical rule, uh, rule of the Ba'athist regime, they went through a lot. And then after that, the days of insecurity and terrorism were incredibly difficult. And even today, where uh, the, the governments are, each government is more corrupt than the previous one. You would think that these people would want to eat each other alive. These are, um, you know, murderers and killers. When you get to the Arba'in and you look at the way that the Iraqi people greet and treat the visitors of Imam Hussein, you are astounded. Um, because these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has transcended these people to become the people that we look towards in the days of Imam al-Zaman alayhi salam. Their akhlaq, the things that they're willing to give away for Imam al Hussein and for the visitors of Imam Hussein is astonishing. And I'll give you one example. I don't know if you've noticed or not, there aren't a lot of pictures of the bedroom of the President of the United States, the sleeping quarters of the White House. Why? The answer is simple. Like even in, in the age of technology, if you Google this, you won't find um, a lot of pictures. All the pictures that are available are pretty dated. Why? Because the bedroom is a sacred place. 
it's private even when you invite people to your house um, typically the bedroom will be closed off and um, you know people don't normally like to have people over in their uh, bedrooms even if that guest is is a close uh, family relative why because the bedroom is 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 sacred it's it's just like that but you see the iraqi people again these allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has transcended these people from being normal people to being the mahdawis that we need them to be and these people will come out not only of their bedrooms they will come out of their houses with their wives and children and sleep on the side of the road to greet people into their houses foreign people people that they know nothing about they don't even know their names they greet them into their homes they have them sleep inside their private bedrooms why because they want them to get up in the morning refreshed and ready to visit Sayyid al-Shuhada, ready to visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam. This, brothers and sisters, is part of the Mahdawi culture that I'm talking about. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the Mahdawi culture, He rids them from all the worldly, materialistic things that, that you and I are, are uh, dealing with and he gives them the qualities that are needed and the criteria that is needed in the supporters of the Mahdi And he rids their hearts from animosity, malice, and ill will towards not only their brothers and sisters, but people from, from other nations, people from different cultures, even countries that they've had a war with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes all of that away from their hearts and fills their hearts with nothing but the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his holy household and the teachings of the Prophet. And this, brothers and sisters, is reminiscent of the supporters of the Mahdi. Listen to this hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Someone comes to Imam al-Baqir and he says, your supporters in the city of Kufa are in great numbers. And if you were to command them, then they would obey your commands. And they would follow you. The Imam asks him one question. He says, have you reached a point where one of your um, brothers in faith has access to your wallet in a way? that if he needs money from you, then he doesn't even need to ask you for permission. He goes directly to your wallet and he takes whatever amount of money he needs and he goes, um, goes along with his life. Have you reached that point where you have that much trust in, in your brothers in faith, in the mu'mineen and the believers? The answer of the person was, was an obvious one. He says, no, obviously. The Imam then says to him, بِدِمَائِهِمْ أَبْخَلْ If you were stingy and you weren't um, the type of person that can give access to his brothers in Iman, to the believers from his money, then he is more stingy towards his blood. He is more protective of his self than of his money, obviously. Then the Imam continues. He says, he says something in the middle and then he talks about what happens in the time of the Mahdi. He says that if the Imam السلام, was to reappear, ila kisi akhi. a man, a mu'min, a believer comes and he grabs whatever he needs from the bag or the pocket or the wallet of his brother without even asking him for permission. And the owner of, of the wallet and the owner of the bag 
wouldn't even stop him. Because in the days of Imam Zaman alayhi salam, this is how we're supposed to be. Total trust, complete trust. We give to our brothers and sisters in the same way that we give to our children, to our wives, to our spouses. And this, brothers and sisters, is what we see in the visitation of al Arba'i. People give the most dearest things towards Imam Hussein towards the visitors of Imam Hussein, their brothers and sisters in faith, their houses, their money. People work for an entire year to collect funds to then be able to serve the visitors of Imam Hussein with the money that they've collected. So imagine this, if you were to take all the money that you make throughout the year to give to the visitors of Imam Hussein And this is why, brothers and sisters, again, at its core, the visitation of Imam Hussein is incredibly Mahdawi. It's the culture of Imam Zaman This is why it is imperative that the believers strive to visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam during the visitation of Al Arba'in, at least once, once in their lives. And even take their children, of course, the ones that can comprehend the grandeur of what is, what is going on. Because at the end of the day, how much can you teach your children? How much can you teach your brothers and sisters in faith? Um, you can't teach them a lot in theory. You need them to learn these things in practice. And by God, if you were to take your children to uh, the visitation of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, you will see and they will see these teachings that we've been talking about on the pulpits, in the mosques, in the centers, they would see these personified. They would see these teachings practiced. And if we were to implement this Mahdawi culture into our lives completely, then the benefits would be innumerable. Listen to this hadith. Himran ibn Ayyan, um, a close companion of Imams al-Baqir and al-Sadiq alayhim as -salam. He comes to Imam al-Baqir, he asks him about a few things. Then he says to the Imam, he says to him, whenever we come to visit you, um, our hearts uh, soften. And uh, we don't even care about the world anymore. We don't care about this materialistic world. We don't look towards the money that is in the hands of, of the people. And then as soon as we leave your, your presence and we leave the gatherings um, that you hold, then we go back to being our old selves again. And we go back to our families, we go back to the market. We become the same people that we used to be. The Imam alayhi salam says that the heart, the Imam alayhi salam says it's natural. The hearts sometimes harden and others, they soften. Then the Imam mentions a story about the companions of the Prophet he says that the prophet, that the companions of the prophet came to him one day, and they said that we are fearful of hypocrisy. We fear that me that we are um, turning into hypocrites. The prophet says, and why do you fear that you may turn into hypocrites? The companions will tell the prophet that whenever we are talking to you, we are reminded of the hereafter. And you make us fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear uh, hell and the punishment of God. And we even forget about this world. And we get to a point where it's as if we're not even looking at this world. This, this whole world is an illusion. What we're actually looking towards and at is the hereafter. And then as soon as we leave your presence and we smell our children and we see our wives, we turn 
and we change and we go back to our old selves again. As, uh, as if nothing even happened to us. Then the Prophet ﷺ replies. He said that these are the footsteps of the shaitan. He tries to lure you back into your old life. Then the Prophet sallallahu um, alaihi wa says to, uh, says to his, his companions, he says, لَوْ تَدُومُونَ عَلَى الْحَالَةِ الَّتِي وَصَفْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ بِهَا If you were to continue on the same path that you mentioned after you meet me and after you see me, لَصَافَحَتْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَلَمَشَيْتُمْ وَمَشَيْتُمْ عَلَى الْمَاءِ if you were to continue in the same path that I order you to stay on, then you will be able to shake hands with the angels and walk on water. This, brothers and sisters, is the Mahdawi culture. Can we maintain a Mahdawi culture? And if we were to integrate fully and completely this Mahdawi culture into our lives, then we would reach the status of perfect alignment with our Imam. And this is what is mentioned towards the end of the uh, visitation of Al Arba'in, the Ziyarah. We say to the Imam, Qalbi liqalbikum silmun wa amri li amrikum taba'a. Our hearts, O oh Imam Hussein, are at peace with whoever your heart is at peace with. We love the lover of Imam Hussein, whoever that person may be. Political differences aside, um, you know, personal issues aside, as long as you love him, oh Imam, then I love him. And whatever you say, I believe in that. I don't have an opinion that differs from your opinion. This is a level of perfect alignment with our Imam, with Sayyid al-Shuhada. And at that stage, there is no meaning for I and me. It's only he. It's only the Imam. Whatever the Imam says, it's what I say. I don't say anything that negates the words of the Imam salam. And that is the level of the likes of Al-Miqdad and Salman and Abu Dhar. Perfect alignment with their Imams with their Imam Amir al-Mu'min That is the level of the likes of Zainab to her Imam. Perfect alignment. The Imam salam gave her a mission to carry out before his martyrdom. Incredibly hard and difficult. He told her that you, Sister Zainab, should be protective of the women and the children. And this by far is the hardest mission that Sayyidah Zainab had to be, uh, had to carry out. Because you try to get a hold of one of the child, the other one runs away. This is why that on the um, night of Ashura, on the day of Ashura at night, Sayyidah Zainab was all around the desert among these vicious monsters looking for Rabaw, looking for Sukaina, looking for this, looking for that. She carried out this mission to a T. But then she came back to visit Imam Hussein. On the Arba'in, she came to him and she says to her brother, this mission that you gave me I carried it out to a T. I did everything I could. I did everything that I had the power to do. And I protected all of them. <laughs> when you left this world and you left me here alone, I was taken. I don't want to talk to you about all of all of the events that happened, but I ended up in Sham. 
يحسين زينب من عفتها للشام دولبها وكتها واليوم جت يل دللتها والعيال يم قبرك جبتها The Arabs had um, a custom Whenever someone goes to visit somebody, they would leave their houses. They would exit their houses and greet the guests. It's as if Zainab is asking her brother to come out and greet them, greet the family, greet his sister, greet his children. I brought all of them back. Rabab, Sukaina, I brought all of them back. However, Brother Hussein, if you were to ask me about one of them, Lo an banatak sa'alitha ya agilak raqayya ma jibitha. If you were to ask about your daughters, there is one of your daughters that I couldn't bring her. I couldn't bring her along with me. I tried. I swear to God, I tried. Agilak raqayya ma jibitha. بالشام يا ابن أمي دفنتها بالشام يا ابن أمي دفنتها لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم نور مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد